So I want to share with you part three. I gave part two a few weeks ago. And the uh, question we're going to look at tonight is how important are Ellen White's messages for today? The average opinion today is that quite a bit of her writings no longer apply because so much time has gone by. So let's take a look at that. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, there is a principle. It says, now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. I call the writers of the Bible book writing prophets. Why? Because there are other prophets in the Bible that are mentioned, but there was no book, or if it was, it wasn't put in the Bible because it was of local application. And so this introduces to us that the writings of Moses are just as valid in our day as they were when Moses wrote them. And we could go down through all the other uh, writers of the Bible, and nothing has been too old to make use of. In fact, it's a continual expansion of truth. Also, Romans 15.4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures. So, whatever God has preserved from the prophets, it is to last all the way to the end. And just in case you think I'm misinterpreting those texts, from Signs of the Times, January 13, 1898. The prophets of God spoke less for their own time than for the ages to come, and especially for the generation that would live amid the scene, last scenes of this earth's history. So the entire Bible was written with the last generation in mind so that we would have everything we need to be faithful in the last days. That also would apply, as we're going to see more evidence of, that same principle applies to Ellen White's writings. And so instead of her writings having less value today, they have more value today because they were written especially for the last generation. In First Selected Messages, page 41, it says the instruction that was given in the early days of the message is to be held as safe instruction to follow in these its closing days. So what God gave in the beginning of the Adventist message is to be of value in the last closing days of earth's history. Another one from third selected message is 76. Abundant light has been given to our people in these last days. What's it talking about? Her own writings. Abundant light. Whether or not my life is spared, my writings will constantly speak, and their work will go forward as long as time shall last. So God never planned for her writings to go partially out of date, and there's very few Adventists that are willing to say it's all out of date. 
They're, they're not brave enough to say that. But many are saying a percentage of it is out of date. But there's no evidence to prove that fact. And also in third selected messages, 77, when he may see fit to let me rest. So she realized she wasn't going to live until Jesus comes. His messages, whose? His messages shall be of even more vital force than when the frail instrumentality through whom they were delivered was living. So her writings are of more force in the last days than they were when they were written. And the people who listened to her, and, and many of them didn't want to follow it either. Uh, she had the same problems that exist today. But we, when we hear that her writings, some of them no longer apply, we can turn a deaf ear to that and study them anyway and practice them anyway. Now, way back in the days of Paul, a warning was given in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, the most notorious group of wolves are the Jesuits. But they're not the only group. When he wrote this, there were no Jesuits. But God revealed to him that as time went on, there would be individuals that would try to destroy the message of God's word. And they will sneak in to the Christian church and corrupt the church if people aren't paying attention. But he mentions a second group. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. These are individuals that belong to the church, but they get mixed up or they yield to what I call the savior syndrome. They think they have discovered something that other people don't know. And one of them, uh, one of the ideas, or there's many of them, but they actually undermine the truth that God has given to his people and what they think is new light. And so uh, both are to be contended with. Both are in the church. You know, somehow we have the idea that all these people are in offshoots somewhere or pretty soon they'll get kicked out uh, and, and have an offshoot. But... That's not the way it's written. These are people that are working inside God's movement. Second Peter 2, verses 1 and 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now, not too many people today will say, I am a prophet because they understand what the Bible says. So the greatest danger is not going to come from prophets, but from teachers. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now, there's many of them, but I don't have time to deal with the ones I see. I'll just mention one. 
There are many false teachers in regard to what is godly music that is appropriate for Seventh-day Adventists to listen to in the last days. And uh, those that speak up about it and point out that that music is not good, uh, they are labeled and they are uh, not liked very well. But God has a plan for our protection. In Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 14, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So God has never been without those that are teaching the truth correctly based on what the apostles wrote, what the prophets wrote, and there are evangelists doing it, and there are pastors doing it, and there are teachers doing it. What is the purpose of those people that are teaching the truth? That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know, you can tell a child almost anything and they believe it. But God has a plan where we do not have to be knocked around by all these false theories and false teachings. In Second Selected Messages, page 78, it says, the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. And when it uses the word testimony here, it's talking about the writings of Ellen White. Now, of course, the Bible will be tankered, uh, tinkered with as well, but the last deception is a deception that makes the writings of Ellen White of none effect. And then it quotes a Bible verse, where there is no vision. We could say where there is no prophet. The people perish. So God knows that if Seventh-day Adventists don't believe and benefit from the writings of Ellen White, they will perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. Again, she's not talking about the Bible, although that is just as important but she's talking about her own writings, that people are going to, in different ways and through different agencies, they're going to cause Adventists to not be sure that they can really follow what she wrote. And that is the true testimony that we need for the last days. And first, the me uh, selected message is 41, says soon, Every possible effort will be made to discount and pervert the truth of the testimonies of God's Spirit. Two key words there. First of all, discount. I've noticed Seventh-day Adventists love discounts. If it's 20% off, they're very happy. If it's 50% off, they... Uh, probably buy some things they don't need. If it's 70% off, they will buy definitely things they don't need. But when a discount is applied to the spirit of prophecy, you know, I hate to make a prediction what I think it is in many people's experience, but I think it's somewhere between 50 to 75% discounted in their minds. 
There's whole books they don't think is necessary to spend our time with because it's not valid today. So we got a big problem to face, but God has protected us by the information that we're going to share here tonight. In the 1888 materials, 194, I tell you, the work God has given me to do has not suffered and is not likely to suffer half as much from open opposers as from my apparent friends. In other words, it says those who appear to be defenders of the testimonies. So the most dangerous people are Seventh-day Adventists who claim that they believe the spirit of prophecy, but they don't believe it all and they don't practice it. But are there real assailants who weaken them and make them of none effect? So here's one of the causes of making the writings of Ellen White of none effect is through Seventh-day Adventists who claim they believe in Ellen White's writings. Now, one that Ellen White deals with quite a bit is Uriah Smith. If you read the 1888 materials books, and I remember one time she told him, you will not be able to recover the damage which you have done by criticizing my writings. Now, Uriah Smith said he believed her writings, but for a time, he was criticizing part of her writings. He never rejected it all, but he was criticizing part of it. And so he was one of those that she's referring to, her apparent friends, but they were undermining the impact of her writings. First selected messages, 48. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. Now also... Those of us that believe it fully and seek to practice it, we're going to taste that hatred as well. So we might as well be prepared for it because Satan is going to develop a hatred kindled against the testimonies. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them for this reason. Why is Satan so concerned? You know, he's concerned about the Bible, but why is he so concerned about her writings? Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions. If the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. Now that Context is her writings. <coughs> the word used is testimonies. That is a direct reference to her writings. So she's saying, God has given me such detailed evidence of what Satan is going to do that if people will believe everything which I have written, they will be able to be protected against all of Satan's deceptions. But if, if Satan can rob them of their confidence in those writings, they're sitting ducks for the devil. In third selected messages, 68 and 9, it says, Many times in my experience, I have been called upon to meet the attitude of a certain class who acknowledged that the testimonies were from God. See, these are those kind of friends that say, we believe in Ellen White's writings, but took the position that this matter and that matter were Sister White's opinion and judgment. So they said, we believe in her writings, but this part we don't believe. 
because that's just her opinion. And you know, I've noticed that every accusation against her writings can be leveled at the Bible as well. When Paul says he heard from the house of Chloe about the divisions that were in the Corinthian church, people said, well, Paul, that's just his opinion. He, he wrote because of what the report he heard. And so they didn't pay attention to what he had to say. Well, that's what Ellen White experienced as well. This suits those who do not love reproof and correction, and who, if their ideas are crossed, have occasion to explain the difference between the human and the divine. Now, let me ask you a question. Can an uninspired person do better than a prophet? It's a no-brainer, as the young people say today. How can anybody think that they can look at a prophet's writings and separate what is sound and what isn't? This is one of Satan's hooks to hang your doubts upon. So if you don't think that you need that counsel, and yet you really do, you're going to be tempted to do what they were doing, saying, well, that was just Ellen White's opinion. Here's an interesting sentence from Third Selected Messages, page 70. I have enough to write of what has been shown me without falling back on my own opinions. So when you think of all the books that she wrote and all the letters that she wrote, which many of them are not in books yet, uh, you can see the truthfulness of that. She doesn't have time to write her own opinions. She can hardly keep up with what God is revealing to her. In Matthew 23, verse 29, Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. As I was preparing this sermon, I that text flashed in my mind and I realized this is what is being done by some people. We buy Ellen White's houses, we buy places where she was and we fix them up and everybody likes to go and visit them, but we're very short on practicing the counsel that Ellen White gave. It's doing the same thing in just a different way, but it's the same tendency. And if we claim that we're a believer in her writings and we're not practicing it, no matter how much money we spend on, on helping people to go to where she used to be, it's a lot more important to do what she said. Testimonies to Ministers 475 and 6. There are many who cannot distinguish between the work of God and that of man. So that's the problem. People can't seem to see the difference. I shall tell the truth as God gives it to me. And I say now, if you continue to find fault, to have a spirit of variance, you will never know the truth. Now, someone's going to say, well, but I've got my Bible. But that's what she said. And she said it because God gave it to her. That if you don't pay attention to my writings, then, and you want to find fault with my writings, then you will never know the truth. Now, people like to quote other quotes that, that to them would say this is not true. 
But we have to find an understanding where we don't have to twist anything or cancel out everything. For instance, she said that if you had really studied the Bible like you should, you wouldn't have needed my writings. But the facts are, even today, that people are not studying their Bible well enough to do without her writings. And so she was shown by God, because of that problem, they're going to need it until the end. They're going to need these writings. Plus, one day as I was thinking about it, since God has gone to all the trouble to give her all this information, is he going to give it to you if you lay her writings aside and say, well, I don't want to study your writings. I just want to get it out of the Bible. No, he's, he's not going to give it to you. If you didn't know anything about her, maybe he would do it for you. But since we have it, we're going to have to use it. First selected messages, 45. When you find men questioning the testimonies, finding fault with them, and seeking to draw away the people from their influence, be assured that God is not working through them. It is another spirit. That's Satan that is being talked about then. Whenever anybody questions any message that God has given through her, and, you know, they get down to some very fine points of, uh, well, the, the one that was uh, given to me when I was in school many years ago was that the counsel that Ellen White gave on bicycles is no longer valid. So I studied that out. I, I took their word for it back then, but after he came to Wildwood, I studied that out for myself. And everything she said about bicycles is still valid. I don't have time to prove that to you tonight, but it hasn't been put aside. In Fifth Testimonies, page 98, I know your danger. If you lose confidence in the testimonies, you will drift away from Bible truth. So here is another warning that for those, now this is not talking about people that are exposed to the fact that we believe she's a prophet. They have the right to check it out, find enough evidence to convince them about it, so this is not talking about them. But this is talking about Seventh-day Adventists who claim to believe in Ellen White's writings, but they are slowly losing confidence in this part and that part, some other part. And it says we can predict that those who start doing that will eventually lose their confidence in the Bible as well. I have been fearful that many would take a questioning, doubting position. And in my distress for your souls, I would warn you. How many will heed the warning? Now, this is a special warning for a, a very large number of Seventh-day Adventists today. As you now hold the testimonies, should one be given crossing your track, correcting your errors, would you feel at perfect liberty to accept or reject any part or the whole? That which you will be least inclined to receive is the very part most needed. God and Satan never work in co-partnership. The testimonies either bear the signet of God or that of Satan. Now, Satan has a much more opportunity, a much greater opportunity to work on Seventh-day Adventists today. Just think about how it was in those days. 
you might receive a letter in the mail that tells you what's wrong with you because God revealed it to Ellen White, what was wrong with you. And in mercy, you got a letter to help you. Now, there was one man, when he got the letter, he was as mad as could be. And he took it upstairs, he stuck it in his trunk, and he forgot about it for 25 years. But one day, the Lord worked to bring his mind to remember it as he attended an Adventist meeting. And so he went home and he read the letter. And the next time he came to the meeting, he told the people, that letter is 100% true. If I had listened to it 25 years ago, my life would have been much better than what it has been because he had spent his life criticizing Ellen White, trying to stop people from believing in her. But you might go to church and Ellen White might be the speaker and she might start pointing out this member is doing this wrong, this member is doing this wrong and that one's doing something else. Now, it wasn't private sins that she was exposing but it was sins that the church knew about but hadn't done anything about it. Or you might hear a sermon that stepped on your toes. That's the way it was back then. But now all you have to do is not read her books. And most people are not reading them. And even if they read them, they don't pray about it to say, Lord, does this apply to me? Do I have this sin that I need to get corrected? In fact, I've come to the conclusion, if you want to pass in the judgment, the investigative judgment, if you want to pass, God has revealed everything you need to know so you can pass. But if you don't read it, you might be blinded to something that you are doing. Now, if you don't have time to read it, of course, God understands. But uh, we need to be busy uh, finding out the material that has been given to us so that we can know what needs to be changed by the power of God. Now, this is a continuation. No, this is not. As the end draws near and the work of giving the last warning to the world extends, it becomes more important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies, which God in his providence has linked with the work of the third angel's message from its very rise. And that's why we're supposed to, in evangelism, present right toward the end, not, not at the beginning, toward the end, the role of Ellen White in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And when people are baptized into the Adventist Church, one of the projects that they need to be doing is reading the writings of Ellen White not neglecting their Bible, but reading her writings as well. Why? We that are in the church are supposed to do what it says here, that as the, the work of the Adventist message goes into all the world, we are to help people understand the value and importance of Ellen White's writings so that they will study it and uh, put into practice what they read. God raised up Ellen White at the very beginning of the third angel's message. And it's God's plan that her writings will be of value all the way through the third angel's message and the loud cry of the third angel given in Revelation 18. Early writings, page 78. <clears throat> God has in that word promise to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but 
for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. So <clears throat> we uh, have Bible evidence that God in the last days would give prophetic instruction and it was to be given for two reasons. Number one, the comfort of his people. Now, when your toes get stepped on, you might not in the beginning feel like it's comfort. But when you practice it, that's when the comfort comes. Very soon, you realize it's a blessing. And, and it makes it easier to live the Christian life so that you can be ready for Jesus' coming. And the second reason is to correct us if we misunderstand our Bibles and, and we start thinking it means this when it doesn't mean that. So those are the two purposes because in the last days, we are supposed to preach the Bible exactly correct, not with any of the human ideas like so many are doing. In the ninth manuscript release, page 198 and 9, it says, The enemy has made his masterly efforts to unsettle the faith of our own people in the testimonies. So he's been working very hard on Seventh-day Adventists. He knows that he can't get them to give it up entirely, but to give up some of it. That's his tactic. And when these errors come in, they claim to prove all the positions by the Bible. Interesting. So they hatch up some Bible text and they try to prove uh, things that are not true. It says, but they misinterpret the scriptures. They make bold assertions as did Elder Canwright and misapply the prophecies and the scriptures to prove falsehood. But remember, Elder Kenwright was less dangerous than Uriah Smith when he started criticizing some of Ellen White's writings. And after men have done their work in weakening the confidence of our churches in the testimonies. Now that is a really important sentence, I believe, because there's two ways that many have been undermining the confidence in the churches in the writings of Ellen White. Number one, some of the comments they make, both in books and in sermons and so on. And second, by not practicing it. You know, if leaders don't practice it, it gives the congregation the idea that this doesn't need to be done. It says, when, when that happens, when men have done their work in weakening the confidence of our churches in the testimonies, they have torn away the barrier that unbelief in the truth shall become widespread. And there is no voice to be lifted up to stay the force of error. Now that really needs to be pondered. Why didn't she say the Bible in that calling the Bible the barrier? She was calling her own writings the barrier against misinterpretations of the Bible. It says they have torn away the barrier. Who did? when they tried to prove something from the Bible that wasn't a proper interpretation of the Bible, then they are tearing away the barrier unless those people are going to study the testimonies. Well, what's Satan after? That unbelief in the truth shall become widespread and there is no voice to be lifted up to stay the force of error. Uh, one big one, I believe, has been the attack on the sanctuary truth, uh, claiming that there's no 
not two apartments in the heavenly sanctuary. And, you know, some of the proponents got kicked out on that one. But it's not dead. And there are people still uh, promoting sanctuary errors even today. Now, going on, finishing the quote, it says, This is just as Satan designed it should be. And those who have been preparing the way for the people to pay no heed to the warnings and reproofs of the testimonies of the Spirit of God will see that a tide of errors of all kinds will spring into life. The Bible says, if you sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. And this one says, if you undermine the confidence of people in the testimonies, you will cause all kinds of errors to spring up in the Adventist church and some people will get kicked out, but not all will get kicked out and it will tempt people to fall for that error. They will claim scripture as their evidence and deceptions of Satan in every form will prevail. So God has given us a wonderful protection against all misinterpretation of the Bible. And that is the vast amount of material. Now, you do have to study widely, not just, you know, because they, they can even twist the spirit of prophecy by using a few references. But if we study widely, it's pretty hard to twist the spirit of prophecy because it speaks so uh, specifically about all the important subjects. So here's what God showed to Ellen White, and we've read it tonight. Many are saying that her writings are not all valid today. They're either saying it with their mouth or they're saying it with their conduct. In fact, many feel we shouldn't use Ellen White's writings in our sermons. Uh, they use it in the Sabbath school class, though, so I don't know why it's a problem in sermons. But um, we do need to be careful if there are people that uh, we have reason to believe we're prejudiced against uh, the material, then uh, we can use some other methods like not saying where we got it from, if we want to use it, or whatever. But the, be the worst thing we can do is make a reference to our inspiration because they're not prepared to see that. They don't have the light to see that yet. Well, God warned her this would happen, that that's what people would do in the last days. She was shown that they would be more needed so on one hand, she was shown that people would discount her writings, but on the other hand, she was shown that they would be more needed than ever. Number three, those who only believe part are really Satan's agents. Number four, the part most needed that is rejected is the part they need the most. It, it's what they're deceived on that they want to reject. So whenever your heart rises up against what you read, you better be careful. You better pray about it. There was a man who got a letter from Ellen White, and uh, she told him a number of things that were wrong with him, Ellen White didn't dare give him the letter because he would just argue against it. So she gave it to a pastor to read to him. And so he objected to four things in the letter that he said, that's not me. I'm not like that. Well, he got home kind of late and his wife wanted to know, why are you so late? So he told about the letter, and he said, but 
there are things in that letter that are not true. And, uh, and his wife wanted to know, well, what, what was it? And so he told her one of the items, and she raised up in her bed, and she said, that's true. And so, you know, she'd been afraid to tell her husband. A lot of wives are afraid to tell their husbands the truth about some things. And so she was afraid to tell him. And and so when she rose up and said, that's true, he had to think again. And after a while, he began to realize it really is true. So the part most needed gets rejected. Number five, God saw the Bible would be misunderstood. More so in the last days than any other part of history that the Bible would be misunderstood. So he gave Seventh-day Adventists information so that they would not be a party to any misinterpretation of the Bible. And six, deceptions would be accepted by many leaders and members. So there's more points that we could get out of those quotes, but those are ones I felt were very important and very clear. And so we need to really understand everything we can from the spirit of prophecy.